So welcome, uh, podcast listeners, to um, our second-to-last episode of the Authentic Conviction podcast. Uh, really excited today. Um, we've got a very, a very established professional and author, and, and uh, I've, I'm, I'm in the process of catching up and getting to know him a little bit better myself. But um, from Seattle, Washington, we have with us uh, Mr. Jordan Tarver. And I'm kind of excited to share this, this, uh, this book title because I love it. But it's, uh, his book title is You Deserve This Shit. And uh, you got to say that with a little gusto, right? But uh, <laughs> and the, and the cool thing, and I looked at this, I was I was pulling it up, is basically, well, the similarities behind you know what we're doing with this authentic conviction movement, and what my whole thought process was from the very beginning of this, to literally your words of find your path and become the best version of yourself. And mm-hmm. in 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 my book, you know, I talk about you know becoming a first rate version of you, not a second rate version of somebody else, and. Um, so it's just, it's, it's almost uncanny how, how, how similar these are. And I didn't even know about it. And so our paths have crossed and I'm really excited about that. So welcome Jordan. And if you don't mind, what we always do is, is, uh, let the listeners know a little bit about you and, uh, you can get kind of give your little, your, your background and your story a little bit, and we'll start unpacking from there. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm super stoked to be here and, um, chatting together. It's, it's really cool that, you know, we do have this similar mindset on things. So it's, it's going to be an uh, exciting conversation to say the least. Um, yeah, so I'm, a, I'm an author of You Deserve This Shit. I'm an editor at Forbes as well. Um, I'm originally from California. I uh, went to school out there, got my business finance degree down in Orange County. Um, and then after college, I went on a solo backpacking trip, with, which was you know the first instance of me getting outside my comfort zone. And that really was the thing that flipped the switch in my head um, that made me want to dedicate my life to, you know, living with more meaning and um, empowering other people to do the same thing. And, you know, since that experience, I've been highly dedicated to this world of self-discovery and trying to experience my own things so I can teach other people things at work. Um, and that's kind of the intention and the the purpose that this book, you know, came to be. And uh, yeah, really excited that, you know, this thing's finally out in the world and um, getting to the you know, right people's hands. Yeah. So, you know, obviously, um, we're not quite done with, with, with the book yet. And so I'm, I'm aware of the challenges that you have. And, um, Mm -hmm. one of the quotes I have it up here right now, I mean, I was really, I was, I was crushing my lunch and I'm, I always like try to utilize these, those minutes, even when you're eating to kind of read and, and clear your mind a little bit. And as I was, I was perusing, this is the second time I've looked at some of your stuff, but it says the true sense of living exists in places of discomfort. And I don't know if you're like, if you get, if you get this as a, as an author or as just as a uh, person that likes to read and, and gain knowledge, but it is amazing how sometimes these, these type of quotes hit you at the perfect time. I've mm-hmm. always said there's times I'm sitting in church and I'm like, man, I feel like the pastor is talking directly to me. Like he may as well just <laughs> use my name. Um, and, and, and where I'm at right now, my, my journey, even this very day with, if it's family stuff or business that really hit me. But, um, you know, I'm sure that there's been a lot of discomfort for you and, and, and seeing this thing through, cause you, you're a young guy, man, but you, that's a, that's a quite a feat to get through what you did on top of working everything else. But um, tell us a little bit about the discomfort that you felt going through this process of writing and, and getting a book out. I think for me, one of the biggest pieces that, you know, was uncomfortable was being vulnerable enough to use my voice. Um, and, understanding that using my voice was actually going to um, provide a benefit and there wasn't going to be, you know, judgment or um, any backlash in that fashion. So I think I believe I was put here uh, on this earth to use my voice. And um, I feel like this was a challenge that I was almost given as a, on purpose, like as a test from the universe to see if I was willing to really step into that, you know, role and, and fulfill that purpose of mine and just, yeah, overcoming yeah, just the challenges of being okay with p- being heard in that in that way, and and putting out things where you're giving advice, I think can be a little bit scary because it's easy to you know get scared or worry how people are going to judge the things that you say that you hold really close to your heart. Uh, and I think that was probably one of the biggest challenges I had, kind of approaching this project and like getting into it. So looking at um, you know these, I mean, can you narrow it down to a moment or a series of moments that gave you the conviction that you really needed to say, you know what, this is what, this is 
I, I you you know people call it a moment of clarity. You know, I know for you, mm-hmm. you talk a little bit about um, we don't want to give the whole thing away. We need the listeners to go <laughs> on and buy the book, um, but. You know, from a high level, what what was it that really changed your thinking at such a young age? I mean, two instances. Um, in 2013, I was a freshman in college um, and I had a close call of death, which really kind of woke me up. We were driving back from an event in Orange County uh, late at night, and a big rig had you know shifted over lanes, causing um, a blind spot for our friend's car actually right next to us. Uh, he swerved, clipped us, you know, going 80, 85 miles an hour down the freeway. Um, our friend's car did two full turns, landed tire side up. We fell on our side, slid um, passenger side door down all the way across the freeway, stopped right before the center divider. All 10 people walked away, no injuries. Um, it should have been an accident where people died is, is blunt and, uh, you know, honest as that, uh, that is, it's, it's, uh, an accident like that. It, yeah. People shouldn't walk. It, it, it just, it was very lucky, fortunate mm-hmm. uh, to say the least. And I think that's something I didn't reflect on in the moment because I was so young still, but I think as I get older, I start to, you know, re- reflect more and more on that experience because I think it really was my, uh, wake up call. It really was the thing that was trying to teach me how fragile this all is. And that was one of the first things that I realized that made me want to, you know, lead a life with this much meaning and also trying to help people get there as well. Um, and then the next thing was going on a solo backpacking trip right out of college. Um, before that I was very unconfident. I don't think I was the best social person. I wasn't sure of myself or who I wanted to be. Um, I felt very timid. Uh, and I think it was very out of character for me to go on that trip. Um, but it was much needed. I was actually talking about this last night with my fiance, just talking about that trip. And it was, it's so interesting. I was reflecting on it. And it, the moment I touched down in London and got off the airplane, it wasn't a slow transition into this new person over the three months I was there. It was like immediate. It was like a switch had flipped. And I realized that if I was going to enjoy this trip, I had to become the person I needed to be like right then and there. Um, and that was like, it like jump started my journey of self-discovery and it just, I came back like a completely different individual mm-hmm. and really th- those two moments, um, is where I draw a lot of, you know, my experiences from and inspiration for, you know, working on a project like this and like really diving into self-discovery and really understanding that, you know, this is my calling and that's, you know, that's why I chased it. Yeah. So as, as I'm a few years ahead of you, I got a little more tread worn off the tires, but, um, you know, I'm a father of three. I've uh, been an entrepreneur for 15 years. I've coached countless sports, played sports through college. I got like this, we call it on this, on this podcast, we call it a tapestry and Mm -hmm. it's amazing to look back. So, um, one of my big life moments when I was seven years old, my father passed away of a heart attack at the age of 36. And that was obviously that's a pretty traumatic moment for, for a child, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. but you start to look at it more as an adult and you, you start to understand how and why you process and what your insecurities are. And it's, it's just crazy because, you know, one of the things that we really want to get out of this is that when people are listening, so when they tune in, if, if they're like, I'm, we, my wife and I take walks in the morning, it's a good time. Not when I'm with her, but if I'm doing it by myself, people want to plug in and listen to something, I hope that they can get something out of it. And I can tell you for mm-hmm. me, and again, I'm taking another thing that I, that I took from your, from uh, unpacking your book a little bit is that, you know, you, you've, you, you, you get to, you get to a place where um, you gain an understanding of who you are through discomfort and mm-hmm. that people don't always want to do that. You use the word vulnerable. Um, and I just think if I look at myself professionally as a coach, as a husband, as a father, once I'm, once I'm aware of who I am, and by the way, I, you and I aren't at the, across the finish line. It's not a destination. It's a journey. You'll be right. more aware of who you are tomorrow than you were today, most likely. Um, mm-hmm. but, but people being willing to address those insecurities and address those vulnerabilities. And until you do that, I definitely use the same message with my daughters. Until you do that, I don't think you can really find a place of strength. 
And, and so, you know, you said your fiance, so you're in the process of planning a wedding and getting married. You're going to gain strength through your partner when you are more vulnerable and willing to trust that person. Mm-hmm. So um, do, do you point to certain relationships that you've had over, over the last, you know, five or so years when you, as you've gone through this journey that you look back and, and look at those, those things as those were, those were, you know, uh, strengthening for you to get you closer to who you are as a person and understanding who you are as a person. Yeah, I think um, a lot of the relationships that I made, even on that solo backpacking trip, were very pivotal for me. They taught me a lot because I was interacting with people that I'd never interacted before, uh, with before, and so for some reason that felt different. It felt um, it felt interesting because I didn't know anyone's intricacies. I didn't know anyone's you know different triggers and um, their qualities, and to be able to learn different things from people. It was almost like I was learning the things that I needed to know from each individual that I met along my path. Mm -hmm. And I was able to kind of um, inherit the qualities that I valued in each of those people into my own life. And I feel like that was a very powerful experience for me because it helped me, you know, make that transformation and um, become stronger in those areas. Mm Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's amazing. You, you don't, uh, and I won't ask this on the podcast. I can tell from looking at you and your hair and everything else, that you're obviously a very young guy. Um, <laughs> obviously much better hair than me, but, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's actually refreshing though, to see, you know, young people grasping this. I think, you know, there's this overplayed, um, you know, we've, we've gone through the whole Simon Sinek start with why, you know, and that, mm-hmm. that was kind of, I love, I listen to his stuff all the time. I've read his books, Leaders Eat Last, Start With Why. I get it. I love it. Um, but I think sometimes things get overplayed. And I always talk to this. I talked to Josh about this. I said, you know, I think we sometimes f- forget how important the how is. You know, I mean, understanding who you are is one thing. But, and I don't know if you can relate to this, but, you know, I didn't have $1 given to me to, for anything. I paid for my college. I got a little help with baseball, um, you know, got out, kind of earned my way. And it's like, on one hand, yeah, it's nice to have some financial support. And I had, I had great financial support. My, my parents provided for me a house to live in a nice community, a place to thrive as a human being. But me earning a lot of those things myself, I'm very self-made. And so I think that, yeah, the why is great. I think that's our journey that we're talking about. You deserve this shit or me talking about authentic conviction is understanding who you are and figuring out who you are through a whole process that you unpack in your book. And I'll do the same thing in mine. But, you know, I like to talk a lot about the how, you know, I'm in the middle right now. We just, we just took on a, 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 we, we, we bought a commercial building and we're turning into this massive just project. That's incredible. It's like a multifunctional, it's just another kind of part of our brand our hub and spokes brand model, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, I've learned more about commercial real estate, construction managers, architecture, you know, uh, a lot of things. And it is, it has become the essence of how, you know, I, I knew what I wanted the building to look like. I knew what the vision was, but man, sticking to it and figuring out this isn't a matter of if it's a matter of how and when, you know, I mean, I don't know if that resonates with you, but, um, you know, I, I mean, you've had to have a journey here throughout this where, again, I, I talked about, it. I don't want to keep beating it down, but with your book and everything else, you've had to have had some challenges along the way. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, do you mean challenges with the book or just, you know, life challenges? Well, to me, I never, I always, I always say, you know, it's, it's easy for people to say, how you doing? You know, you hear that all the time. Hey, Jordan, how you doing? Right. And yeah, you're it's like, the same answer, you know, it's like, how, Oh, good. How about you? Yeah, like, <laughs> wait, are you asking? Cause you want to answer. Are you just being nice? You know? Yeah. Um, right. And for me, I don't, I don't think that guys like us are ever able to separate what that means. Cause in that moment, if I'm having, if I'm struggling with something with my kids or things are a little stressful at work or this, this building project is going, that's going to be my dominating trigger response. Right. Mm-hmm. But I don't think we have the convenience of separating them. So your balance and how you handle the ups and the downs, I mean, you're going through your normal life you obviously mm-hmm. are very established. You, you, you write for Forbes, I believe, right? Which is in and of itself amazing. And on Thank top you. of that, you're publishing a book. You're about to get married. Like, that's what I mean. You had to, you had to have figured out this how over the last two years of your life, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's 
I think I'm able to do all these things because I align myself with um, things that I'm generally interested in. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's how I do it. I guess it's, it's, I choose to do things that fulfill me and bring me joy. And I don't align with things that are going to deplete me or require um, things of me that I may not want to do or may make me unhappy. And, And that goes from, you know, my passion of writing and my skill of writing to even the types of people I hang around with the, the type of interactions I have with my fiance on a daily basis outside of work. Um, all that really adds up into this, you know, I guess equation of, of how I can do all these things and how I can overcome the challenges that I face is making sure that I'm, I'm just aligning myself in life and on all fronts, uh, in a way that I feel like everything I'm doing is, is something that I, I, I chose for myself because it was something I generally wanted to include in my, my personal life. Mm-hmm. It's a lot more enjoyable when you're accomplishing things and you have people that you love around you to share it with. Oh, you know, 100%. It's... I think as I get older and I was just talking about talking to Josh um, about this before, but I, I feel like as I get older, I'm focusing more on community and the people around me and, and realizing how important that is just on a, like, a life level, you know, like just feeling good to have a a network of people that love and support you, whether that is in person or, you know, online, what, whatever that is and whatever capacity it is for each person. But yeah, just as I, I journey further and further along my path and face new challenges, I feel like it's very, it's just easier to overcome things when you have people there to almost help you through when you can't do it yourself. Mm -hmm. It's nice to have a guiding hand or someone to lean on or someone to vent to or someone to go to advice uh, for. Um, It's much easier when there's someone like that, you know, in the same room or, you know, a phone call away, whatever it be for you. Yep. And I, you know, there, there's a, there's an art to keeping that network fresh, you know, because for sure. My wife and I talk about this all the time. We're, we're going through something with our kids right now. We're trying to use it as a learning experience. They're very involved in sports and you're always going to have adversity in sports. You know, everybody knows mm-hmm. that, but you know, we, we just always remind ourselves like, this is why we always have to look out for each other. Like our family comes first, you know? And, but, but with my wife and I, we have a very tight knit group of friends that we know we can call at any point. And we joke around, we, we call it friend inventory. So every year you kind of look at like, <laughs> You know, my buddy that was cool to hang out with in our college apartment at my, I went to Miami of Ohio, but it's like my, my buddy was my, you know, who was my drinking buddy who threw up under the couch, you know, and it was really funny back then. I don't, I'm not really obligated to be friends with that person just because we knew each other at age 20. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay to understand what the expectation is with certain friendships and certain support. And I would say more than anything, alignment, you know, we're on this journey so I have, I have two daughters and a son, and I will tell you, my son's pretty mature. He's 14, but my 16 year old daughter is, is a little bit, you know, I would say the girls mature a lot quicker than the boys, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and so for us, we're always a little bit behind. They hit puberty first. They kind of go through a journey quicker than we do as men biologically, but yeah. we're, we're on this path and we're learning about ourselves as we go. And it's next to impossible to do. If you don't step back and look and say, who are the people around me that I know are aligned with me? A lot of times people think because you and I like to boat or you and I like to climb mountains or whatever it is we do, we're, that, that's, that's aligning us. That's not an identity. I think an identity is do we align with how we think and the things that we value, you know, and the things. And, oh, by the way, it would be nice if we get to play golf together or climb mountains together or whatever. Right, right. But, you know, I'm sure that you guys walk through that as, as a couple as well, both professionally and personally. Yeah, yeah. Um- I feel, you know, fortunate and, and grateful on the, the connections I made through college because I have a core group of friends. Um, there's a total of six of us, you know, and we do think on the same level and we do have um, a lot of shared values. And we've been able to um, kind of create a mastermind group just within our own connections that we made through college. And it's it, we're very core unit. Um, and there are people that, you know, I can rely on um, in moments of adversity and challenge and if I need advice for the book or if I need advice for life or, you know, whatever it may be, I, I know I can, you know, I'm now in Seattle. So it's, it's different because they're in California and um, some are in Texas. And so now we're spreading out, you know, further across the country, but um, you know, there's still a phone call away to get the same support 
Um, and I have that with my fiance too. Like she's literally my best friend and, um, we share, you know, our, we're fortunate that our values are literally like a one-to-one like mirror of each other. And, um, so it's, it's nice to have someone like that around all the time because yeah, there's just like, there's a deep connection that it's, it's almost hard to explain. And the easiest way to explain it is to experience it. Mm Mm-hmm. That's you're going to need that, man. I'm not trying to mentor you here, uh, (laughs) but been, been married, uh, 18 years and we have three children together and it's, you know, at the end of the day, you're you're always going to have moments where you don't get along and and you're a little bit upset with one another. But if that friendship and that bond is true and it's there and you're and you can be open and vulnerable and honest with one another, uh, again, not trying to be Dr. Phil, but I think it's, you're so far ahead of the curve and just that awareness and that, and that understanding, because, um, too many times people are just, you know, uh, on the surface, everything looks great, but there's no depth, you know, there's no yeah. substance there. And so, um, but so, so switching gears here, um, you know, again, I, I have a lot of people that will email me and ask me, they're, they're so excited about this word that is, is so popular now, this entrepreneur word. Right. Mm-hmm. And I've been blessed to, um, again, I go back to that word, the how, I just, I was like this in sports is just gritty and I don't stop until I get my, you know, achieve my goal. Um, Mm -hmm. and so it's really helped me get through things where I may not have been as smart as the next guy. I always had the ability to figure things out and be tenacious, you know, and get through it and do it without ever panicking and staying calm through the process. Um, and I share that freely because in our conviction, our authentic conviction movement here, it's funny how people aren't good at sharing the things that make them great. They are, they've been almost, almost been taught to think that that's arrogant or, you know, uh, just not acceptable in society. And I think, well, if, if we're so quick to beat ourselves up, why can't we acknowledge the things that make us who we are? Um, right. So, but these people that message me and reach out and say, you know, Joe, this is what I'm thinking about doing or what's your feedback on this? What's your guidance on this? And a lot of them are young people and I love it. I really do. Um, because I do think that I will never tell somebody you can't do something, you know, like, yeah, I'm five, nine on a good day. The NBA probably wasn't in my cards, but <laughs> so I always say within reason, you can do anything that you right, want. Right. Yeah. But that's all good and well, this like fluffy, Oh yeah, I want to be an entrepreneur. But at the end of the day, you better have some balance. You better have a plan and you better follow through with it. So somebody that's listening to this thinks, all right, this Jordan guy's sharp. Man. He's, he's a, he's a humble guy. He's a hardworking guy. He's obviously successful. You're able to write, publish and sell a book. Okay. Um, and now not only that, but you write for Forbes, there has to be some secret sauce there where for you, where, you know, you, you say, all right, this is how I structure my day, my week. How are you able to balance the things that you balance where somebody said, what does your week look like? How do you structure yourself to make sure that you're in line with what's important to you that week? My big thing is time blocking. And um, that's kind of my secret sauce, um, which is, creating little blocks of time in my calendar for a specific task. And so, for example, when I was writing the book, every, you know, Monday through Friday, every day from 7.30 a.m. to 9 a.m., it was the same thing every single day. And so I knew for that hour and a half, all I needed to do was focus on the book and nothing else else mattered during that, that time frame. And so I, if I know the priorities of the week, the things that need to be completed by Friday, let's say, I can then organize my time in a fashion using time blocks to help me achieve that. And also my work ethic is very similar to, to how you were just, you know, describing yourself, uh, very gritty. Um, if I have my eyes set on something, it's going to happen. I'm, I'm, I'm a man of my word. Um, which just means that if I say I'm going to dedicate myself to achieving a goal, I'm, I'm going to dedicate myself to achieving that goal. And it's, it's going to happen because that's just, you know, the, 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 the work that I lead and and that's kind of the energy that I put into something is I want to be able to put something of myself into everything that I do. Um, and I think that level of dedication has taught me how to, um, do everything that I do successfully Mm -hmm. and to complete it and to execute it. I'm, I'm very big on, if you're going to say something, you also have to execute that thing. Um, I think a lot of times people struggle with execution of goals. Um, they maybe, you know, set 
two lofty goals or they set a goal, but they don't give themselves the action steps to get there. Um, and that's why people come short on, you know, executing what they say. And, and so for me, the time blocking really, really helps me execute the things that I say I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. You a sports fan? Oh yeah. 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 So again, I'm dating myself here, but I'm a huge Michael Jordan fan. Okay. Um, and I remember watching the Bulls in the in the nineties, you know. Mm-hmm. But watching that, I don't know. Did you watch the uh, Last Dance? Oh, that was like one of the best documentaries I think. I've oh my god! Wow. And the one of the things that stuck out it was kind of cool because it was like I was watching it for the first time. Although I literally never missed a Bulls game ever. Like we had to. It was a uh, TBS. I think is what they were always on, right? Chicago's. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I are uh, one of those uh, w, WGN. Sorry. And I remember watching these these games, and then I was watching that over. I'm like, wow, I don't remember that. I didn't we always remember what we want to remember, and then and then yeah. you do it so long that you actually believe it as truth. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but one of the things that really stuck out to me that that Michael was asked, they, they they said, you know, did you were you nervous in these big moments, nervous nervous in these games? And it kind of like it was almost like, I like I've never really thought of it that way. And he said, how in the world can I be nervous? when I know that I poured in more preparation and more practice than mm-hmm. anybody else out there, I, at that point, it's just, if I'm making the shot, I'm making the shot, but I'm not nervous because I know I've prepared myself. And so for me, yeah. I used to compete in golf and amateur tournaments and, and um, was pretty good back in the day. I'm still a low handicap, but there are a lot of times where I get asked to play in an outing or play in something. And I haven't picked up a golf club in two months I feel like crap when I go because my mind knows what I'm capable of. And then I'm holding the golf club and I'm trying to do something that is really difficult in and of itself. And I haven't put in any work. So now I'm upset for the result that I didn't get for something I never worked for. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think especially young people get stuck in this is that they want things right now. It's a microwave yeah. society. Like, oh, if I don't get it right now, I'm, 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 I'm done. I'm giving up. And so now, again, they're complaining about the result they didn't get because of the work they didn't put in. Um, you know, and so, you know, I don't know if you had a, a young person sitting next to you right now with that mindset, what in your book is, is the guidance to say, bro, you got you to put a lot more time than that. I mean, you address that, that part of like that grit and that determination to get overcome and be committed to something for a long period of time. Yeah, I, I feel like I make it very known in my in my book that you have to invest your time in yourself if you want to see results, real real results. And like you're saying, people are people expect instant gratification right now. I think we live in a time where um, because of things on social media, for example, of you know how quick it is to get feedback, how quick it is for something to possibly go viral or get a like, um, it, it's teaching us our brain to think that that's how everything is fed to us in this instant um, fashion. And, you know, that's not true for most things in life and it's Mm -hmm. not true for your self discovery. It's not true for your personal growth. It's not true for your business growth. You know, it's a long play. And I think I just, yeah, I try to make it known that you, you just have to have the willingness to, you know, put in the time, like you said, if you want the results. And I think that's true for, you know, every aspect of the book and each, each of the three pillars. One of my biggest concerns with with generations that are coming up right now, I, I will include my, my son and my and my daughters, um, really my youngest two, but um, you know I'll use my son as an example. Outstanding athlete, basketball, baseball. Um, as of now, if he wanted to stick with it, I don't have any doubt that he could play you know college sports. Same with my daughter, and she's also very musically gifted. But it's like he'll spend as much time on Fortnite you know, and playing that and think, oh, he sees these people on social media and everything else that are, they're getting paid, you know, to game. And then I look at, and by the way, I love Gary Vee. I always watch his stuff. I try to watch as much as I can to just kind of aggregate my, my, my thinking and my education. But my biggest concern is you see all these people stand up at these symposiums and seminars and say, I want to do this. And it's like six out of 10 of these young people that stand up and say, this is what I want to do. They're picking something that is kind of easy and it's just something that they like to do as a hobby. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm worried that, that, that this whole, Oh, you can do anything you want. You just stick with it and don't listen to your parents move out. And then nobody has control over you and blah, 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 blah. And then they're going to go down a path and realize, Oh my, like I would have with the NBA, like maybe this wasn't <laughs> the right idea. 
Right. I mean, yeah. have, you know, do, I don't know if you share that thought, but it kind of worries me. I don't know what, how you feel about it, but I'm worried that people are getting away from actually finding something. Like for you, it's writing. You're obviously a talented writer, right? But you had to figure you. out that you were a writer. And, and mm-hmm. that wasn't easy. And nor was yeah. writing a book, publishing it, selling it, anything else. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, is that something that, that, that you worry about with these generations coming up that they're picking things as an easy way out? Yeah, definitely. I think um, we're seeing it more and more. I think there was some article or something like that that I read. It was some study on asking, you know, the up and coming generation what, what they want to do when they grew up. And like, you know, the majority of them were wanting to be like YouTube you know, uh, stars or something like that. And I think there's, there's a tendency for this generation to be choosing technology based, um, career paths, which provide that more instant gratification. But sometimes I don't know, um, the longevity of those paths because it is a newer type of work. And so we haven't seen it play out really, um, for when that generation actually gets older. Um, so yeah, sometimes I do question just this new way of going after what it is that you like just right in that moment. And some of these, you know, these kids are making these decisions, you know, when they're 13, 14, 15, it's like, God, when I was 13, 14, 15, like I wasn't worried about, you know, anything online. Mm-hmm. Um, and even at 18, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Even at 19, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what I wanted to do until I was, you know, 22, um, which I'm fortunate because that's still, I feel like a very young age to know that and have the understanding, but I feel like it's almost getting younger now where, where kids are making these decisions on what they want to do for the rest of their life, which, you know, I'm not sure if the, the brain is mature enough to actually make that decision. Mm-hmm. It's still developing. And I, you know, right, right. I mean, I would say, um, this question got asked to me about a week ago. It said, if you had, if you had the front page of the wall street journal and somebody's interviewing you, what would your article be about? Like, that's, that's an interesting question. I really, I've been in smaller papers, but I'm like, okay, if I had, if I could capture my whole thing, wouldn't be about how to become an entrepreneur and all these things that I'm passionate about. I'm I'm obviously, I'm a financial advisor. I love talking about, you know, how to, how to invest people's money. And, and, you know, based on what I know to be true about taxes and income and blah, blah, blah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, The reality is, is I think, I would talk more about what we call a be, do, have mindset um, instead of a have, do, be. So I think a lot of young people, a lot of people that, that are seeking guidance um, want to have the things that they want in their mind, then they can do the things that they want to do and then become the person that they want. everybody wants them to be. Mm. Instead of, I'm going to figure out who I am so I can be the right person which will control my actions and how I do things. And then ultimately I'll have the things that I want. And um, so tonight we're having our, our year end dinner. I'm hosting our whole, I ran a youth baseball program that they traveled the country. I and mean, these kids are tremendous athletes, but more importantly, they're better young men and they have great families. And I went back and did some of the math. They're 14, Jordan. Okay. And I, I've seen these kids play since they were eight. You have coached them for six of those seven years. They're they're They've won over 260 games. Wow. And over 40 tournaments. That's crazy. And so as an, as an eight and nine, you and 10, you competitive. And let me tell you something, it's a crazy world in youth sports, right? All <laughs> these dads that say, Oh, my kid's great. I want to go. And they, they want wins. They want trophies. They want to travel and blah, blah, blah. So all those things that you think are important at eight, nine and 10, I'm sitting here at 14 and we've been at the peak and we've been nationally competitive for seven years. I'd give all 260 of those wins back to have one more year with them at nine U when they were just young kids enjoying the game. Mm -hmm. So I think in life, you know, I say that about money and things now is, you know, when I got into this business in the financial world at 21 years old, I wanted the nice car. I wanted the, the pretty wife and the big house and all that stuff. Right. And I have all those things now and I could care less because the only thing I want more of is time with my family, enjoyment of life, and to be able to just, you know, take in these moments because we don't know how many mm. we're going to have. So it's like these things that you chase end up becoming the things that you don't even care about once you have them. So mm. I don't know how you would encapsulate that in an article. But for me, coming from not a lot, dealing with losing, a, I think the journey of figuring out who you are, the more that you can advance that, more so than your bank account, <laughs> corrects everything. It's the best so, investment. How do we put that? How do we put that in a headline? 
<laughs> we'll get it on Forbes somehow. You deserve this shit. That's what, that's how we'll say it. So, um, so let me change gears again with you real quick. Cause I, I just love, I love le- learning about people's uh, stories and, and yeah. everything else. So tell me a little bit. So tell me what you do for Forbes. Cause I want to hear some of the interesting things that you've experienced while writing for Forbes. Yeah. So, um, I'm actually an editor, um, for their personal finance section. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I primarily focus on loans and credit score content. Mm-hmm. Um, my job is about, I would say like 80% editing, 20% writing. And mm-hmm. so I'm a, at the core, I'm a writer by trade. That's how I came up. Um, my journey started um, at a publication out of New York City called Fit Small Business. Um, and I wrote about credit cards and banking then. That's kind of where, my, where I started as a writer. Started as a junior writer, was promoted to a staff writer six months later. And then another six months later, I was promoted to an editor, and that's kind of where my editing journey started. And then I jumped ships and uh, started working at Forbes uh, November of, uh, or sorry, December of 2020. Um, so I've been there for you know about seven or eight months. Um, it's you know quite possibly the best job I've ever had. Um, the flexibility, the people, the culture. Um, it's it's always important for me to work for a company where. Um, they see you as humans and not as uh, robots, mm-hmm. I like to say. Yep. Um, and so they treat you that you actually have a life outside of work. And I feel like I've luckily I've got that at my last two jobs. And um, yeah, so I, I right now I'm editing um, personal finance stuff. And that's my goal when I was looking for like the perfect job was how can I cross like my knowledge out of a business finance degree um, I always thought I wanted to be, you know, a financial advisor or analyst because I wanted that sexy paycheck. I wanted that, you know, all that just accolades that may have, that I thought came with it. And then mm-hmm. I kind of got outside of school and I was, wait, I was like, wait a second, like, I don't think that's actually what I want to do. And so I was able to find a way to cross my passion of writing with the knowledge of finance. And that's kind of what I do to this day. Yeah. That's a big realization. I was, I, I was able to speak at Miami university. I went back to my alma mater and spoke to their entire school of business. Mm-hmm. And it was really cool. Cause these, these kids engaged, they came up and were asking a lot of questions. It was three back to back to back 90 minute sessions. So mentally it was pretty wow. exhausting. And I, I like to talk, you know, that's, that's where my <laughs> energy is. I like to communicate with people and I'm passionate about that. But it was, it was amazing how many of these guys came up and gals and said, you know, I'm thinking I want to do what you I want to be a financial advisor. And it's, you're right. It's such a, oh, that sounds cool. But then I'm like, um, where are your clients going to come from? <laughs> and, and it was like, what? They don't realize that, you know, it's not about, you know, how smart you are, how much you know about finance. The true essence of a financial advisor position is your ability to build relationships and go find new people to meet with. Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of that misperception, right? Now, if you love finance, you can do corporate finance, you can do other things, but yeah, without a client in front of you, there's not really much to talk about. <laughs> so uh, I think it's, it's kind of what we talk about again in our book is finding that conviction. Are you in the world of, I hate to use this word, but in the sales world, um, mm-hmm. you know, working in teams, you can have people that can analyze and, and build portfolios. But again, you can build the best portfolio in the world if nobody needs it or wants it it's kind of, it's, it's not really relevant. Mm-hmm. Um, what, what are there any, are there any, so when you're going through, whether it's writing or editing, um, where you've come across something and thought, wow, that's pretty fascinating, whether it was a person, a company, or even a financial concept, or do you have moments like that where you're, where you're kind of taken, you know, taken aback and you're learning about something new or have had kind of an exciting moment while you're going through something, or is it, more mundane and really just kind of tactical in what you do. Are you able to dig in and, and really get in and learn more about these financial concepts that maybe you didn't know already know? Yeah, for sure. I think that's actually kind of the, the blessing of this job is that I'm able to learn about topics that I probably wouldn't have gone and researched myself because Mm -hmm. um, I sign out a specific amount of articles per month that range, um, you know, on various topic areas uh, specific to loans and credit score, but there's concepts and things that, you know, may cross my plate that, you know, I I wouldn't Google on my day to day, you know, or that I may experience in my future. And so this knowledge is actually important to me because um, if I cross, you know, the path of whatever, you know, said concept is in the future, I now have an understanding of that. And that's like, 
that's something I actually, when I first started uh, in the workforce, I was in the mortgage industry um, prior to, you know, finding my first writing job. And as much as I hated that job, I think what I tried to take from it was the fact that I could get knowledge of the industry um, at the age of 21 and 22, when I knew I'd be buying a house in the future. And so it's it kind of that perspective shift of how can I incorporate the lessons and things that I'm learning in my professional life into my personal life. And that's why I do, um, I really believe in a work-life integration and not necessarily always a work-life balance is mm -hmm. how can I take the things that I learned professionally and integrate them in personal life? And how can I take the person I am in my personal life and incorporate that on a team aspect in my professional life. And that's how I've been able to kind of merge the two and see how things can complement each other. That, that's it, how important is that too? I mean, I, I'm not trying to bash our public school systems, but our kids are not learning basic life skills. Mm -mm. They can tell you who the 16th president was, but they don't understand what a mortgage interest rate is. I mean, I've, right. I recently, you'll love this. You're in the credit world and, and maybe this is another nugget that our listeners can grab. This is just something so simple, but so my daughter's 16. She just got her first car. She's so excited. She, we never see her anymore, right? We have to like plan family dinners so that we're all together, you know? Um, yeah. Which you'll learn all about that soon enough. But, um, <laughs> you know, I just, I, through my research and, and talking to people and, and I, I just learned, all right, so I've got this little Capital One card that I got. I added her as a user, her social mm -hmm. security number. So when she's getting gas and things like that, She's building credit so that by the time mm -hmm. she goes to college, she has credit. She has an established report. And she's going to have an 800 score. Um, mm -hmm. And now she's understanding, oh, I made $300 at Taco Bell this week. That's where she's working. It's convenient sometimes when I'm craving it. Um, <laughs> you know, but, but, and I say, well, honey, it's, is that gross or net? And she kind of looked at me and I said, okay, sit down. It's forcing us to have these conversations because mm -hmm. they're not learning a lot of this in school, personal finance, just basic life skills. So that's, right. that's good that you were able to, and you entered the world as a young person in a really good interest rate environment too, didn't you? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I didn't love that job while I was in it, but looking back now, I'm definitely grateful for the, you know, the life lessons that it taught me that I didn't learn, you know, in college. Yeah. And once you, once you grasp some of them, it's like riding a bike, right? So yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in closing here, a couple things, we mix it up. We do a couple different things here, but I'm just curious. I like to hear, especially from, from younger people. Um, what is, what is, uh, what does Jordan's world look like five years from today? If you're, if you're painting your perfect picture, what are you striving for? What does that look like for you? Um, just having a well-established, uh, you know, business under my name. Um, kind of expanding this, you know, self-discovery realm that I'm working on right now that's in its early stages and, and having it, you know, be an established thing that I'm known for and that I'm kind of like the self-discovery guy in a way um, for people that are looking to kind of tap into their journey for the first time. Um, not sure like where I'd be living. Our, me and my fiance are very much go on the flow people. Um, you know, we picked up our stuff in November of 2020, moved from West Hollywood to Seattle, never been to Washington in my entire life and, until I signed the lease at this place that we're in now. And that's a, a very good snapshot of our character and what we're open to. Um, so for me, it's, it's always hard to define this five-year plan because I feel as much as I do have a vision for my future, at the same time, I do believe in, um, you know, jumping on opportunities that arise in the moment. And so it's hard to tell what, what will come my way in the next five years, but I have uh, big visions, high expectations for myself. And I think that I, you know, I'm more than capable to seize all of that. That's awesome. And so when, um, you know, people get to the end of this and they want to learn more about your book and a little bit more about you, mm -hmm. where can we send them? Yeah. Yeah. Jordantarver.com will be the spot you want to go. If you want to learn more about the book. Um, I'm also very active on Instagram at Jordan Tarver. So if you follow me there, you'll see a lot of uh, current stuff that I'm working on. You also see, you know, different types of uh, insights of, you know, what you'll learn in the book if you haven't purchased a copy yet. Um, but if you're looking to really, you know, have the keys to this gateway of self-discovery, I believe like my book can do that for you. And um, you can find all the information on my website. And looking at the demographic, I mean, Josh has done a great job. We set out to do this as a project that really made an impact on people mm -hmm. across, across lines. I mean, I've had, I've had people as young as 17 tell me, oh my gosh, I listened to your 
to your podcast. Yeah. And, and so I think this will get their attention uh, since there's, since uh, they can say the word shit when they're talking about your book, they think they probably think <laughs> that's cool. But um, honestly, I, it's reaching people. It really is. And, and, you know, I've, I've, I've never claimed to be Gary V or any of those, but you know what? Um, I'd be lying to you if I said, I, I don't have aspirations of, of being at that level one day where mm-hmm. we can have that kind of reach and that kind of impact. Because I feel like when, when the character and the heart and everything is in line, like mm-hmm. you said, I love what you say about, be, you know, being conscious. You know, we go through life and we're not always conscious. <laughs> we're living in all the stress that we have going on. Like I, I joke around, I'm like, I've got like nine plates spinning in any given day. And what yeah. happens is, is this, this brain that, you know, takes up less than 8% of your body's mass consumes 80% of its fuel. And if you can't find a way to be conscious, it's going to really be hard to be intentional about the things mm-hmm. that you need to be attention, intentional yeah. about in life. And I think there's a lot for, for people to learn from that. And your message is incredible, man. And your energy and your path. I'm inspired, man. I love, love this. I really have. And I really hope to Thank keep you. in touch with you. Um, yeah, for sure. And, um, but I, when, when I get the book, I'll definitely read it. I'll pump through it in probably a weekend. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I'll be following up with you for sure. So Jordan, I really appreciate you being on. I look forward to, uh, keeping a relationship with you and checking in on, on you and your fiance and, and, and your path ahead, my man. I appreciate it. I really do. It was, uh, you know, great to connect here and have this conversation. And, um, yeah, it, it's always, it's always a, a good feeling when you can cross paths with, uh, people in the flesh that, you know, you share almost a uh, mirrored, you know, values and uh, beliefs and all that stuff aligns and makes a connection feel pretty honest and genuine from the beginning. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. True, authentic conviction, man. So, um, there you have it. yes, sir. So, uh, go check out the book, um, check out Jordan He's uh, he's an incredible young man, um, beyond, beyond your years, man, for sure. So, uh, thanks for tuning in to our 22nd, um, Second to last, Jordan, uh, with your name, especially how cool is that fitting? Because I'm doing 23 episodes of my first season for the greatest number 23 of all time, Michael Jordan. So you're number 22. What's even better is 22 is my life lucky number. So this is uh, this is all perfect. Uh, How about the moment that I told you that I really needed to see your message revolved around my daughter's soccer career and her soccer number has always been number 22. (laughs) I'm not joking. (laughs) Can't so, make this stuff up. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so, uh, wow, that's awesome. So, uh, well, she's going to crack up at that. I'm going to tell her that today. <laughs> so thanks again, Jordan. Thank you for everybody uh, tuning into the Authentic Conviction Podcast. And uh, look forward to catching up with you soon, my friend. You too.